Well, we're continuing in our series called Divine Appointments. Let me begin with a quote from 19th century Anglican Bishop J.C. Ryle, who wrote, True Christianity is a fight. There's a vast quantity of religion current in the world which is not true, genuine Christianity. It passes muster, it satisfies sleepy consciences, but it is not good money. There are thousands of men and women who go to churches every Sunday, but you never see any fight about their religion of spiritual strife and exertion and conflict and self-denial and watching and warring. They know literally nothing at all. 20th century scholar, novelist, author, theologian C.S. Lewis similarly wrote uh, when he was comparing Christianity to pantheistic religions, he wrote this. Confronted with a cancer or a slum, the pantheist can say, if you could only see it from the divine point of view, you would realize that this is also God. The Christian replies, don't talk damned nonsense. For Christianity is a fighting religion. It thinks God made the world, the space, and time, heat, and cold, all the colors and tastes, and all the animals and vegetables are things that God made up out of his own head as a man makes up a story. But it also thinks that a great many things have gone wrong with the world that God made and that God insists and insists very loudly on our putting them right again. When the Bible speaks about encounters with supernatural evil, it uses battle language. Jesus said, the kingdom of God suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. The apostle Paul said to fight the good fight of faith and wage good warfare, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Today's message is called the divine showdown. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 4. Today's message is not like the other divine appointments in this series because this is a divine appointment not with Jesus, but for Jesus. No other human being witnesses this event. It was only witnessed by Jesus himself. It happened in a parenthetical period. It happened during the transition between his baptism in the Jordan and his introduction into public ministry, we know that in the chapter preceding, in Matthew chapter 3, Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist. John is, is stunned when Jesus comes to him to be baptized, says, no, you really should be baptizing me. Jesus says, suffer it so for now to fulfill all righteousness. And when he is baptized and he comes up out of the water, the Bible says the heavens open. The Spirit of God descends upon him like a dove, and the Father audibly utters, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Outside of the crucifixion, the baptism of Jesus is the only event that appears in all four Gospels. It's crucial, and it is crucially connected to the showdown. Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, where the Bible says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. The word then is mentioned twice in this passage. Words like then are easy to skip over, but these thens 
are extremely important. In verse 1 it says, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit. And then in verse 11 it says, then the devil left him. Solomon wrote, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Then Jesus was led up. Then the devil left him. Now when Luke records this event, he adds this. At the very end, now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. You see, there will be times and seasons when everything is going up. There will be times and seasons when all of your charts and graphs will be going up and to the right. There will be seasons of peace, seasons of joy, seasons of productivity, seasons of fulfillment. Good times, happy times. But I hate to burst your bubble on this fine Sunday morning, but if you're going to live on purpose and if you're going to be on mission, if you're going to grow spiritually and advance the kingdom of God, if Christ is going to be formed on the inside of you, those seasons of peace, joy, fulfillment, and productivity will not go uninterrupted. There will be times and seasons where you have to fight where you have to fight for your survival, where you have to fight for your sanity, where you have to fight for your family. Listen, you will encounter opposition at varying degrees. Sometimes they'll just be distractions. Other times they'll be annoying disturbances and frustrations. Sometimes they'll be veiled attempts to manipulate you, to get you off course. And sometimes they are all out demonic attacks. And this text proves it. This is where the first then comes in. You see, the first then, verse 1, is inextricably connected to the baptism. It connects the baptism with the wilderness. It functions like a therefore. The baptism and the temptation are connected tightly by one single word, then. And that means after great blessing and success came trial and temptation. No one can ever secure a life of unending earthly success without seasons of struggle. As hard as we try, no matter what precautions we take, no matter how well things are going, something comes in to oppose it. Even the most talented, uh, talented and diligent and savvy people can't ex escape the undulations of life. And you might say, well, what if we did our part better? What if, what, if we, you know, what if we lived good lives? What if we obeyed God? What if we prayed every day and we asked God to protect us from all difficulty? What if you could actually overcome all your faults and all your flaws? What if you could become perfectly wise, understand the ways of God, understand the human heart, the times and the seasons so that you always made perfect decisions? What if you could have faith in God that was unwavering? What if you were perfectly pleasing to God, then surely your life would always go well, right? Wrong. Because here, here it stands. Here's the one who did. God the Father has just said that Jesus' life is perfectly pleasing to him. And the Spirit of God has descended upon him to guide him and empower him and baptize him and anoint him. And look what happens. He, he is loved, he is affirmed, he is empowered by God, and then, then happens. Jesus is led by the Spirit into a dry place, an empty place, all alone to face the embodiment of pure evil. It's like this encounter with evil is placed precisely here, in the life of Jesus, to demonstrably say, no one is exempt from trials, trouble, and temptation. Listen, Job's comforters, Job's friends were wrong. And God rebuked them at the end of the book for it. They, they told Job repeatedly, if you do right, if you live right, if you, if you, then your life will be the sum total of your choices. And if you choose wisely, everything will always go well for you. Wrong. Wrong. There's an evil entity out there. 
that magnifies and complicates and perpetuates the bad things that are happening in the social and, and psychological systems of this world. Listen to me. Christianity says there's way more evil than you can account for in the world than just from the cumulative effect of wrong individual choices. And you can attribute the inexplicable malevolence to actual demonic forces. The Bible says that evil is both natural and supernatural. That behind the acts of evil people are evil spirits. The evil is both individual and socially systemic. There is no way to, to, to get fully away from it or even get to the bottom of it with a purely secular or even scientific understanding. Evil is more multidimensional, it is more nuanced, it is more complex than, than the world and all the supposed experts suggest. In addition to systemic injustices and personal ignorance and, and physiological imbalances, there are forces of spiritual evil that have been unleashed in the world. Principalities and powers and rulers of spiritual wickedness, unclean spirits, familiar spirits, and behind them all is a singular, supernatural, malignant being. Who is at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of all racism and bigotry and misogyny? He seeks to divide and conquer. He seeks to weaken and exploit. He seeks to ravage and oppress and lay waste. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's the father of lies. He is the serpent of old. And here in Matthew chapter 4, he is called both the tempter and the devil. But understand this, because there are demonic forces, it only makes logical sense that true goodness and godliness would actually attract those attacks. And that's exactly what we see happening here in this account, the connection between the baptism and the temptation. So when you're under attack, it's a good sign. Let me say that again. I said, when you're under attack, it's a good sign. Listen, if you have no opposition <laughs> in your life, you have to ask yourself, am I growing? Am I making a difference? Am I all in? This shall be a sign unto you. If you are facing jacked up, inexplicably heinous pushback, the adversary must consider you to be a threat. And the good news is, what the enemy meant for evil, God meant for good. Listen, you can defeat the wiles of the wicked one every time because he has ultimately been defeated by Jesus. And by the way, the devil was defeated by Jesus in a weakened state. Think about it. Jesus was fasting for 40 days. He was now hungry. That means starvation has begun to settle in. He was radically dehydrated. He is nowhere near full physical strength. And in that state of physical weakness, he still sent the enemy packing. He still sent the enemy scurrying away with his tail right between his legs. Listen carefully. And three years later, he will defeat him with finality through weakness, hands and feet pierced, brow and face bloodied and bruised beyond recognition, back torn open by a cat of nine tails. And he said his, as he said his last statements with his last breath, proving once again that the weakness of Jesus is exponentially and immeasurably and infinitely more power than the strength of the serpent. Through death, he defeated him who had power over death, even the devil. Listen to me carefully. God has good purposes for us hidden on the far side of the wilderness. Just as Job had to, had, had to ignore 
ignorant advice and, and, and persevere in trial and turmoil, turning him into an example that has helped hundreds of millions of people. And just as Jesus' temptations prepared him for his history-changing and world-saving mission, listen to me, so God's Spirit leads us into our wilderness for our good. And if your foe friends, if your frenemies, if your accusers and condemners try to blame you, they try to tell you that something must be wrong with you because you're going through it, you reject that and you turn around and you tell them this is all a part of God's wise plan for transforming my life from good into something great. So how does that happen? After his baptism, Jesus enters his ministry as the Spirit-anointed, Father-confirmed Messianic Deliverer. But he does not do so by preaching first, but by fasting. Instead of initiating some sort of public reformation, he goes to the desert privately. But it's more than a spiritual retreat. The, the desert is the place for this first showdown between competing kingdoms and their rulers, between the two figures who lay claim to the hearts and souls of men and women. So rather than retreat, Jesus is actually advancing the kingdom. My family, sometimes you have to take a step back to go forward. Let me say that again. Sometimes you have to take a step back to go forward. Sometimes you have to take a step back and scope out the situation. You have to take a step back and survey the task at hand. You have to gather all your faculties. You have to count the cost. You have to take stock of what you have at your disposal. Jesus always withdrew before he advanced. He spent the night in prayer before he chose the 12 disciples. He was by himself up on a hill before he walked on water. It's important to be prepared before you are propelled. You have to prepare the ground before you can plant a seed. You have to tend to the root before you can pick the fruit. There is pruning to be done before there is fruit that remains. And what looks like a step back is usually just a set up for a quantum leap forward. Jesus is in the wilderness for, and he's being tempted, by the way, for the entire 40 days and 40 nights. We only get a glimpse at the final three temptations. Now, the word in the original language for temptation could just as easily be translated testing. You see, to a certain degree, temptation is testing. When the enemy tempts you, God uses it as a test. Now, James is clear. God never tempts anyone with evil. But when the enemy tempts with evil, God uses it as a test for good. Know this, God never tests you so that you fail. Let me say that again. He is never testing you so that you fail. God, your Father, who always has your best interest in, at heart, your Father, who loves you with an everlasting love, never tests you so that you fail. He tests you so that you pass and are promoted. Understand this. The wilderness is God's school. It, it, the wilderness is the university of adversity. It, it, but it is also the platform for your promotion. Think about it. Jesus doesn't get to Galilee. He doesn't get to Capernaum. He doesn't get to the miracles. He doesn't get to the healings. He doesn't get to feeding the 5,000. He doesn't cleanse the leper. He doesn't raise the dead. If he doesn't first go through the wilderness. The wilderness prepares you for your destiny. No, no wonder that just prior to this, you have John the Baptist baptizing in the wilderness. Flip back a page to, to Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1 where it says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Let me say that again. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Listen to me carefully. There's a voice in your wilderness. And it is a voice that says, prepare, prepare, 
Now's the time to prepare. Guard your heart with all diligence. Be sober. Be vigilant. Watch and pray. Commit. Be alert. Be aware. Make his path straight. Get something straightened out in your life. The wilderness prepares you for where God is taking you. The wilderness is where you get alone with God. The wilderness is where you overcome carnal mindedness. The, the, the wilderness is actually your path to your purpose. So if you're there now, if you're in a dry spiritual place, if you've felt alone emotionally, if you've been tired and tested, know this, something good is just up ahead for you. Your breakthrough is about to manifest. The confusion is about to clear up. The power of the Spirit is about to be unleashed. Surely goodness and mercy are following you. The hand of God will sustain you. You are on the right path. Now do the right thing on the right path and watch God do what only God can do. The tempter says, if thou be the Son of God, if thou be the Son of God, if thou be the Son of God. There, there's so much to this that we don't have time today to cover it all. Now, we have touched on certain aspects of this recently, like the fact that the only way that the enemy knows that Jesus is the Son of God is because he heard the Father audibly say it at the baptism in Jordan. The devil's not omniscient. The devil, he, he doesn't know everything. He's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere all the time. The only way he knew is, is the way that everybody else knew. He heard it at the Jordan. But the father didn't say that Jesus is just the son of God. What did the father say? This is my beloved son. This is my beloved son. And that's Satan's main military goal. He wants Jesus, in this instance, to lose the certainty, the, the assurance of God's full acceptance and his unconditional fatherly love. The enemy always wants to omit the love of God. And he wants you to forget. He wants you to forget that you are loved to the same degree, to the same measure, without condition, no matter what, at all times, with no strings attached, even in your worst moment on your worst day, you are loved at the same level that the Father loves the Son, the same level that the Father loves Jesus himself. Old Slewfoot wants you to forget. He wants you to forget the security of your self-image rests in a love you can't lose. You see, when your self-image is not based on your performance, when your self-image is not based on your own goodness, when it's not based on, on your efforts or your achievement, but when your identity is based on the one love that never fails, listen to me, there's unlimited power in that. When, when you know that your father is the almighty sovereign creator of the universe and he loves you. That's powerful. And Satan wants at all costs to stop you from acquiring that kind of power. But, but, we, but we, we don't have time for that. So, so as we're getting closer to closing, I, I want to just give you a couple of very powerful principles. First... Know this, that temptation in and of itself is not sin. Right? Jesus was tempted, but he never sinned. You see, temptation is, is nothing more than a bait, is, is bait on a hook. So that you can be hooked. So that you can be reeled away from your mission. And be lured away from the plan, purpose, and will of God for your life. Lean in here. Because when God gives you an assignment, the devil designs a distraction. Uh, let me say that again. When God gives you an assignment, the devil designs a distraction. Distractions are subtle. And the devil is a master distractor. And he knows when you're distracted from the battle you were born for, you'll face a battle you're not equipped for. Keep the main thing the main thing. 
Stay on mission, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. A great and effective door has been opened unto you, and there are many adversaries. So like Nehemiah, don't come off the wall. Pick your battles wisely. Don't get distracted by gossip. Don't let somebody spew in your ear. Don't respond to everything and everyone. Don't stoop to stupid levels. It was Jesus who said, don't cast your pearls before swine. Listen to me, you don't have to roll around in the mud with people who have nothing better to do than roll around in the mud. God hasn't called you into the muck and the mire. God has lifted you out of the miry clay and put your feet upon a rock. Don't get distracted. See, distraction is the destruction of your dream in slow motion. Don't be distracted. Don't take the bait of troublemakers. Don't take the bait of people who want to make you take on their offense and pollute your soul in the process. My God, this is good preaching. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Listen, there are people who, who listen, don't succumb to the attempts of people to manipulate and control you. No one can guilt you into doing anything. No one can shame you to doing anything. You are immune to witchcraft. So what does the wicked one do? In general, Satan doesn't try to control us with fang marks on our neck, uh, but, but with lies in the heart. He suggests ideas to the heart and the mind that contradict God's word, that impugn God's character, and try to destroy the trust relationship that you have with him. See, Satan wants to destroy your grasp on the truth. But even more, he wants to affect the beliefs of your heart. Because what the heart believes, the mind defends, the emotions desire, and the will carries out. Now follow me closely here. When you are in moments of pain or shock or, or under massive pressure or you're threatened, the things that come out of your heart, your mind and your mouth, are the most primal things in your being. So what comes out of Jesus? Under duress Jesus. Starving Jesus. What, what's on his mind when he's all alone? Jesus uses the scripture every time he is assaulted by the devil. He speaks the word. He quotes what he has studied. He declares what he has memorized. The word that he has hidden in his heart. Now, think about this. If Jesus Christ, the Son of God, did not presume to face the forces of evil in the world without a profound knowledge of the Bible in mind and heart, how could we try to face life any other way? And let me say this. I get it. You know, I get it. When, 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 other, when you ask other people to pray for you, I get that. Well, I get when you ask other people to lay hands on you. I get asking other people to intercede on your behalf. But there are some battles that no one else can fight for you. There are some battles that you're going to have to fight all by yourself, even if it means you're you have to fight them alone. And there are battles that you do have to fight alone. Sometimes you have to fight your past alone. Sometimes you have to fight your addictions alone. Sometimes you have to fight your own feelings, your, your out-of-bounds emotional reflexes alone. There are some battles that no other saint, no other believer, no other brother or sister, and your pastors cannot fight for you. It's a battle you have to face. It's a battle you can't avoid or advocate or delegate. It's an enemy you can't negotiate or compromise with. You're going to have to man up or woman up and put on the whole armor of God and fight. My family, you have to build an arsenal to face the enemy. 
You have to build a stockpile of supernatural ammunition. You have to be locked and loaded with the Word of God. You have to do your homework and your heart work. You have to read. You have to meditate. You have to memorize. Thy Word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Because this Word is a sword. I said this Word is a sword. It is the sword of the Spirit. It is the only offensive weapon in the armor of God. It is living, powerful, and it's two-edged. How many of you know it cuts going in and it cuts coming out? It cuts away the evil desires within like a surgeon's scalpel and it cuts off the head of the enemy like David did with Goliath's own sword. Oh, listen to me today. The sword that was coming at you will be turned on the one who was wielding it. Why? Because the ultimate victory is always when evil is turned on itself. And it is how God always gets the victory. Because, listen carefully, Jesus wasn't just victorious in the wilderness. No, the devil left him until an opportune time. And that opportune time was three years later on Calvary's cross. You see, there was some Serious demonic activity. There was some serious paranormal activity going on at Calvary. There was some premature, excessive celebration by the underworld at the place of the skull. Think think about this. A thief who's hanging next to Jesus. Did you hear that? A thief. A thief hanging next to Jesus turns to him and says... If you are the Son of God, take yourself down from here and bring us with you. Think about it. Does that sound familiar to you? Have you heard a thief say that before? And then what does Jesus do? He quotes from Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But listen to me. On your own time, read the rest of Psalm 22 because it prophesies of the cross in detail. Hundreds and hundreds of years before the cross ever happened. It prophesies. It talks about the one whose hands and feet would be pierced. But also in that psalm, in Psalm 22, the pierced one, the forsaken one, cries out, the bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouth. They shoot at me with their lip. Listen to me carefully. That's the demonic activity at Calvary. But how many of you know the celebration was premature? Because what the enemy thought was his greatest victory was actually his ultimate defeat. It was the blood that he shed that ultimately brought him down. It was the wounds the enemy inflicted that fatally wounded him. His sword was turned on himself. Evil was turned on evil. And by his wounds we are healed. You see, Jesus defeated the enemy in the wilderness with the word, but Jesus defeated the enemy with finality because he was the word. Stay with me here. Jesus won the ultimate victory, the cosmic victory, the eternal victory, not by speaking the word, but by giving himself. Ready? We are overcomers. We are more than conquerors. We have the victory not just because we have the word of the Lord, but because we have the Lord of the word. Jesus is with you. He is for you. And if God be for you, who can be against you? He's a very present help in the time of trouble. He is your sword and your shield. He is your shield and your exceeding great reward. He goes before you. He's your rear guard. He encompasses you round about. He is your defender. He is your champion. He is with you always. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And you are coming out of your wilderness just like Jesus did. You're coming out of the desert into your destiny. You're coming out of dry places into living water. You're coming out of your battle with new boldness. You're coming out of your confrontation with new courage. You're coming out of this appointment massively anointed and you're coming out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit.